August is one of the top British rising stars of today. Her first breakout role came as a child in the musical The Lion King, but she began her on-screen career in Hollyoaks. More recently, she's been a pivotal part of HBO's hugely successful Game of Thrones, the Maze Runner trilogy, and Netflix's Army of Thieves. But you'll probably know her best for playing Ramsay alongside Vin Diesel in the Fast and Furious franchise. Our guest today is Natalie Emmanuel. Hey, how's it going? Good, man. Sorry I'm late. It's for you. Oh, no, it's all good. It's all good. It's been a long time, but it's so nice to see your face. And you look very well. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing okay. Yeah, um, I have a, I, like, I had to put a face on today because it's like the first time in a while. Because um, it's really, at the moment, it's like some downtime. So I'm spending a lot of time in, like, sweats and, like, pyjamas. So I was like, I should probably you know, make, make myself look somewhat <laughs> presentable. Well, you look very nice. It's the lockdown look, isn't it? You, I mean, months of just sort of being in trackies. Yeah, um, my natural And that whole, that whole thing where you've got, I've got a jumper on here, which is really nice, but then I've got tracksuit bottoms underneath, so you can't see them, so it's all good. We've known each, each other for a while since you, you did Hollyoaks, which is, I can't believe how long ago that is now um, I think I think we were I, I don't I don't know how old you are but I know that we I was about 19 when we met yeah. 18, 19 when we worked yeah, so, I, so really mean, it's been some time 21. it's been a long time it's been a long time yeah let's not let's not give away ages, let's not though. get into the but... maths of it let's <laughs> not do that <laughs> no just for me like seeing you know we basically obviously you had other things before Holly Oaks, you did Lion King and things like that, which we'll get into. Um, but you know, seeing you go from Holly Oaks to what you've achieved now is pretty amazing. Like it, it's for me, I'm just watching it going, Well done, that it's like you've done so well. And 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 I want to just talk about how before all of that, how did it all start? How did the the kind of love of acting and the interest where did that where did that evolve from? Well, um, it started off really as like a hobby, like a fun hobby that my mum kind of got us into. Um, she wanted us to have, you know, extra curricular things, but also I was like a really shy kid and just like had attachment issues to her. Like if she dropped me at school, if she dropped me at even other family members houses I just didn't want to be away from her I was very like a needy cry child and I think it was just like an effort to help me build confidence away from her it was like oh this fun thing that you really love doing and you know like away from me it sort of like had a it, there was like a purpose as much as there was it was also for fun I think I was probably just driving her crazy she was like I need to do something with this child um but we both got into it very young and it was just really it really was just a fun activity to do and um yeah and then I guess like I have um, a cousin who was kind of into the whole like performing arts stuff too. And my auntie said, oh, you should probably get the girls like signed up to an agency because if there's shows or like, you know, that fun things that they can do, like they can help bring opportunities. So that's sort of how we got into it. But it really was just fun. Like my mum is like not, you know, like a show mum who's like, my child's going to be the star. It was like, do you want to do this thing and I'd be like yeah and she'd go okay I'll, I'll see if I can take you there or someone can take you there and then if not it would be like all right you don't have to do it sort of thing so it was all just very like relaxed and then actually because it was such a joy for us both and a joy for me to do like it became just like a bit of an obsession and then we wanted to just do all of it and just audition for everything in our local area and up in London because I'm from South End originally um and so that's kind of yeah it's kind of how it started someone um, just said that they would pay me to do it <laughs> for free and I was like oh you're like wait a minute <laughs> you want me to oh yeah sure whatever you want um this is so fun so yeah 
Well, I remember you telling me about your experience on Lion King. Well, what an amazing thing that is. But how early on did that come? Was that like one of the first things you went for? Or was there like a build up to that? Um, you know, my first like proper professional job, I was like five and I did a advert for British Airways is um, duty free video that used to play on the, the airplanes. And it was funny because my my nan lived in St. Lucia at the time and um, she used to see it when she used to fly back and forth because it was on the long haul flights. And yeah, and I was like five years old and I was I had to pretend to be asleep with a toy. And then I kind of like had to pretend to like roll over when the director told me to and I would not keep my eyes closed like he was like like you just have to keep your eyes closed until pretend to sleep until I say cut and um, I was just not doing it and then he said do you know what if you do it you can keep the toy and I was like hmm interesting I see what you did there and I also saw you have a second one over there uh... I'd like to take that too for my sister that's all right and then they were like, yeah, all right. And that was my first proper, like, professional job. And I've negotiated my own terms, apparently, at five years That's old. That's where the love began, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, but so it sort of started like that. And it was, it, I, I think Lion King was, like, the pro first proper, like, moment where I was, I went through a really extensive audition process. They, they auditioned thousands of kids from a, around the UK and um and then yeah I had to go I got down I had like something like 10 rounds or something nine or 10 rounds of auditions it was so extensive and then I kind of got it and it was like a six month run so it was a job it was like a full-on you're playing this character you're doing this job for six months so that was probably like the the kind of first moment where I went oh okay so this is what this is like and also this is amazing I want to do this for a career like I know that now so that was really a turning point that must have been um kind of I mean did you struggle with the whole obviously you were saying that you were always very attached to your mom and wanted to be at home with her how did that play out when you got a job like that was it kind <laughs> of like ah or... to be honest, it was so much fun that I didn't yeah. like worry I didn't worry about it like I think by that point because I I sort of started dancing and and singing and acting and all of that when I was about three so by the time I got to like 10, when I did The Lion King, I'd sort of had many years of just, you know, having built all this confidence and built all this um, experience away from my mom. And like, um, it was just the best thing ever. Like I have done so many wonderful jobs and I'm so like excited and grateful for all of them. But like, when I think back, I'm like, that one just, fills my heart with the feeling that is like no other and um and I'm still like really good friends with people from that show who have known me for like a long time so it's just yeah it's just really it was a really special time and my mom used to like um well, my parents used to like drive me from South End or like get on the train with me after school or whatever like we just um it was it was a really kind of yeah just like it was just so exciting and I just so wanted to be there we were just like we had to just make it happen somehow like you know it was really really fun so it's mad that the show is still now I mean it's still going to this day oh, which is yeah. kind of uh so kind of crazy it's so oh, good. It's so good. It's one of the it's one of the best, isn't it? It's one of those ones. Yeah, uh, it, we just so I think right before lockdown, they celebrated twenty years on the London stage on the London West End in the London West End, and so mm. it was just really amazing. Like it was really special, uh, and like what was so amazing about it was that all of the sort of original Simbas and Nalas, there was only six of us. So there's three girls and three boys. Mm. And I think now they have like more pairs, like to, to sort of circ circulate through the weeks. And um, they, we all were there. And that was like the first time we'd all been together properly in what, 20 years. <laughs> and it was, 
insane wow. and yeah it was just we were it was so emotional like it's such a beautiful show and you know that it it was amazing because the opportunities for like black and and mixed actors on the west end stage and for parts was like really they're really weren't that many and suddenly there's this show and they're like we are casting actively targeting casting you know black and you know um brown people and it was just felt like such a moment and so to see like 20 years pass and then see where all of those people have gone was really amazing like it was emotional because I think it was a big platform or a big kind of like starting point for lots of people and they've all gone off to do really cool things and like exciting things so yeah it's a very special show and I don't know if you saw the video of um them coming back to rehearsal after the lockdown after the shutdown no no oh no <laughs> it, 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 it makes me cry even what like I've seen it so many times every time I'm like ah. but what's so amazing is Iguana who plays Rafiki she was in my cast of when I did it but she was playing a different part I think she was um you know just she's an amazing singer I think she was one of oh. the uh the ensemble and yeah. she is now Rafiki and you know yeah and I was like it's so original like it was amazing anyway. and that is mad isn't it that must be so surreal for her to come back like so many years later and play a completely different part Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I think she's on. Sorry, I'm talking. Shout out, Guana, who's amazing. But we, um, we, I think she's doing a, on a different. She's on like she's doing it in a different place now. I think she's not in London anymore. But you know, she. Mm. But just to that video of them all coming back into rehearsal. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love to. I love to check that out for sure. Is that <laughs> how? How? What was the like? Obviously, on your because that's stage, and then you know you look at IMDb, and then that's obviously more film and TV and stuff. Yeah. Did you do many other plays, many more musicals, anything else in between? Um, Polly Oaks and that? Not really. I mean, I did a cut. I did. I did Annie in my like local theatre club um, in South End, um, and uh, it was that was really fun. Um, but I think once I did Lion King, I went into uh, senior school. I did my level. I was doing my eleven plus. I was preparing for my 11 plus while I was doing that show and my mom used to send me to, to to work with she'd be like I want one practice paper in verbal reasoning before that you get home and I want one English paper before you get home and I'd be like oh, okay mum so that was like also what was going on at the same time and then I got into my I passed my 11 plus thank goodness and then I <laughs> went to senior school and it was a much um, a much more academic school so my mum was a bit like school comes first so anything that kind of took me out of school where I would need like tutoring outside of school or had to or have to leave school or anything like that it wasn't really possible um, for us to do that and my mum just was wanted me to mm. you know have like have an education yeah no she it was the right decision and I think it obviously like through your teenage years like I mean it was it was um I still did the odd thing like the odd advert like that was two or three days mm. filming or a couple of days or a day like that was one thing but something that was like oh you're going to be on stage for the next three months or six months or that sh job in Wales that is at you know shooting here for three months we just didn't go for them we just were like you can't do that so we just knew what it was and then once I kind of hit 16 which was when you could leave school um before the rules changed um it's like uh um before the rules changed it was like my mum said okay you can do the odd thing but once you hit 16 and you finished your your schooling um you can I don't know like do whatever you want really I can't really like stop you mm. um but I like you know continue in your education is what she wanted me to do it must be so tricky for a parent to yeah. you know if your kid loves doing something to be like no you still need to like concentrate on school and you still need to get yeah. the right balance because it's you know it's a harsh it's a harsh industry your parents are going to want you to 
have a backup you know yeah that's what and it was just very funny because I was I had just turned 17 when I mm. got um Hollyoaks and yeah I just turned 17 and I was about to sort of do my AS levels and um yeah I I think <laughs> it was like I turned 17 in March and I left for Liverpool like within like two months of turning 17 mm -hmm. and I and I left school which you know I realized if for some would be like wait you literally just like left school at such a young age and you didn't I didn't finish I'm basically like a dropout you know which I'll be honest like I was always a very academic kid so it was it feels strange to me to not have finished it and not have finished something um but I was literally being presented with the thing that I you know the opportunity to do the thing that I wanted to do and it was just really I just it was really difficult to say no to and I remember when I went to school and I was like um by the way guys I'm leaving on Monday uh to go and move to Liverpool bye um like a good bunch of my teachers essentially were like Natalie I'd like to see you uh and oh, just no. try to talk me out of it because you know and that's their job as educators to go stay in your education and you know it was a really really tough decision but I think I always had the feeling that you know school will always be there if you want to learn you will and um and it's still on the agenda for me to finish and to get a degree. Like that's something that I'd like to do in my lifetime. And like, mm. I, I don't, um, yeah, I don't feel like I'd made the wrong choice or it was the bad choice or the better choice. I like, I just feel like that was the choice I made for myself at the time. And, um, and luckily it worked out and for a while it really, really didn't. And then it did. So, you know, who knows, like it's different for everybody, but yeah, it was a strange, it was a really tough choice because I liked school. I was like a proper, like, I was one of those weirdos that liked going to school <laughs> and liked learning. <laughs> so, yeah. It was, yeah, strange. And and you touched on there, like, there was a there was a time where it nearly didn't work out. When, at what point was that? Was that kind of a, what period of, of your career was that? It was like post Holly Oaks, when I left Holly Oaks. Yeah, the, the phones did not ring for me in my agency's office. It was like, I mean, I hadn't trained. I'd been on a soap and you know the stigma that comes with having done soap, which mm. is definitely not as bad as it was. But, you know, you still see it or hear about it sometimes. And you're like, you know, but I think enough people have kind of gone on to do other things now that people are like, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Mm. Um, it's actually mm. a good experience um uh but it took do you know what it did it took for a few of us to do the like stateside thing because they don't really know our soaps or anything so yeah. it's like they had they were kind of like oh yeah but she can she's she can do it and she, you know she's right for the part and she did a great audition why not her they don't really think of the like kind of snobbery that comes around all of that stuff and Definitely. you know but I did not get seen for a lot of things <laughs> and I was like this is crazy so I was like mm. out of work for a while and you know working in retail and that's, doing a, that's good to hear out. though because for a lot of people listening to this they'll just presume you know they've seen what you've done they're like oh she must have always worked but like to hear that especially after you've done like something like Hollyoaks which in this country is very well known it's it's very mainstream a lot of people watch it but yeah. I had a similar experience and I know you know a few of the people we share friend we have friends that we share it's they've got a similar thing as well there's like a kind of a year two year issue oh, yeah. after you do something yeah like yeah <laughs> you can, like, disappear for a while and then like yeah you know, yeah you have to go and get a job in a pub for a bit and then yeah. kind of wait for people to forget you were in that and then come back and do something different yeah. um but that yeah I mean it's kind of mad that isn't it you you as an actor you're given a job and you're like yes I got this job and it's like a year's contract amazing you don't think about what effect that can have um yeah I mean th there was definitely like a conversation about like whether or not I should do a soap you know because of those stigmas but I just felt so strongly like this is the first time that I've had a character to play 
on mm. screen and it's like an ongoing thing like this felt like an opportunity for me to like figure out what kind of actor I was like if I was even any good <laughs> like I mean it it was, you know, I was learning. I was 17 just, and I was, I had never been on a proper set before really. And I hadn't even just like the idea of like hitting a mark, all of that stuff was so new and foreign to me. And I worked all that stuff out there, mm. you know, and I had the opportunity to play a range of things. Like my character arrived and her mom is killed in a hit and run she went through um, love and heartbreak and drug addiction and big jump there, you know, all of that. But, you know, I had, I had opportunities to play comedic stuff. I got opportunity to sometimes be a bit of a villain. Like there was just a lot of like playing around and, um, and figuring out like how to do that how to build a person and build a character and and it was really it was a really fundamental experience for me and I will that will always be true um doesn't matter how many other things I've done or what other kinds of jobs I do you know that was where I kind of figured it all out a bit and then it gave me uh it gave me tools that I still use today so I can't really, can't really say anything. It's, about it's a kind of, um, it's kind of like a drama school. It's like yeah. you go there and you learn, as you say, the basics and hit your mark and the lingo and, you know, to actually have to learn lines. And we didn't have very much time to do it sometimes, you know, it's, it was <laughs> quite... no time. It was so, it was so funny because sometimes as well, like someone would be sick, right? And you, they, you wouldn't know that you'd be going, well, because obviously I would have to go through like an hour, hour and a half of hair and makeup in the morning. And I'd be going through hair and makeup and then someone would come down from production and go, so-and-so's um, actually really not well today. So we're going to pull that scene forward where you find out your mum died. We're going to do that right now. Like, so in about half an hour. So do you just, yeah, we're going to do that because that's all we can shoot today and suddenly you're having obviously I'm exaggerating that's not the exact situation but it's like that is suddenly you've got to pull out a performance of like the most devastating almost whatever high drama high dramatic moment out of nowhere and you're suddenly you're you're, you're thinking that you've you come in and you're like ribbing your friend mm. something and it's all very light and then suddenly it's like can you just pull out this really dark dramatic performance like in about 45 minutes that'd be really good thanks so it gave me this like um this sort of on your toes never know what's going to happen and having finding that access to certain things without much kind of time or preparation because some if you get the schedule and you'd be like oh that seems in about two weeks okay I've got some time to sort of ruminate on that sit on that see what comes out and then suddenly it's like oh yeah sorry that's all we that's all we've got we've got time to shoot and you're like uh you know oh, so man. it definitely put you through it and so yeah you're right like it is almost like a training um in a sense like, so well, <laughs> very much so there were so many times where yeah it's like being dyslexic that's like my nightmare as well and they're like oh you learned the lines for something else that we weren't meant to be shooting for another week oh yeah we're gonna do that now and it's that kind of thing where you just the blood drains <laughs> and you're like oh god oh god I've got to do that now but it they always were like you know one or two takes weren't they so it was kind of like you either get it right or you don't and then they leave <laughs> one anyway so it's fine oh god I I remember um a particular moment we I can't even remember what the story was but we were all in the car and the car there was a car crash and then we were under the car flipped over do you remember yeah and it oh was like God, so January in Liverpool. It was freezing. Freezing under that bridge. Yeah, yeah, under yeah, yeah. Bridge in like down by the like docks or something. Yeah. Oh my it God. was so cold. I don't know if I've ever been that cold um, before or since. And then there was an explosion, and we had to <laughs> time our, our jump with it. And I was the <laughs> only one that that balls it up and jumped to. <laughs> I mean, it's actually oh, crazy oh. that we were doing that. Like yeah. when I like just having gone on to other things where, 
you know, I've been in a lot of things where there's fire and explosions and things mm. happening behind you. A lot of that is not done with the actors. It's, <laughs> it really isn't. And um, even, even within a certain, like, distance, it's like they'll just use stunt people and then, okay. you know, do a close-up or, or, you know, they'll do something where it's, like, much more control. But the fact that we did that is hilarious. <laughs> Probably the most dangerous stunt you've ever done. <laughs> that would be weird. So, I mean, obviously Hollyoaks and then you had the gap and, you know, it was hard to get jobs. But what was it like when you finally got like, and obviously you did Misfits, didn't you? But in between, yeah. um, obviously getting the big, the big break with um, the Fast and Furious and obviously Game of Thrones. But what, get which came first? Was it, was it Game of Thrones or Fast and Furious? It was Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that like getting that phone call? I mean, obviously you know it's become huge now but I guess at the time it wasn't it, as big you, you wouldn't well, have known if it was gonna it, it, do you know what it was like it felt like one of those things that like industry people watched like when I spoke to other actors or other like people in the industry they knew what Game of Thrones was Nina Gold casting did it so like she's a very very respected very very celebrated um casting director and Rob Stern who you know she who um who they work together and it's like they obviously a lot of people knew about it because they're like oh hbo doing this fantasy show but if you ask anybody else they was just like what if you're not into fantasy you would not have known what it was you wouldn't have known like you wouldn't have i thought in at the time so when i was telling people about it or the people were like oh i heard you got a job what tell me about it it was like I would tell them and they would be like yeah sounds great like they just had no like there was no kind of reference really but then suddenly I felt like there was a turning point and then suddenly everybody knew about it and I don't know when exactly that was but I felt when I because I first went to Los Angeles um right before I um that all aired I hadn't aired on the show yet and um I basically uh yeah I basically went out there and everybody knew that I was going to be in Game of Thrones it was so weird and like people would be like wait and I need that girl that's gonna be in Game of Thrones like because they everybody knew about it there but I think in the UK they didn't really mm -hmm. um but when I got that phone call I was <laughs> I was walking you know do you remember that big Tesco on um on um I think it's on Smith Down Road in Liverpool it's like a big Tesco in, in Toxteth because that's where I lived Oh, you were still in Liverpool at the time? Yeah, I was like oh working, my God, I I was working in retail. I'd been, I'd gone to get my shopping. I was walking home. I got into my flat. And as I came into my building, I got a phone call from my, um, uh, my agent who I hadn't, who she, uh, the specific agent is no longer there, but she phoned me and she was like, uh, Natalie, you got it. And I'd also auditioned for uh, like a pretty well-paying advert because they pay quite well. So I was like, oh, great. Oh, cool. That's good. I don't have to worry about the bills for maybe like a month because that was be a quite nice little payday. And she was like, I said, all right, so when do I come to London for the, fit like, you know, for the fittings and stuff? And she was like, you mean Belfast? And I was like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And she was like, oh, it's game you got Game of Thrones and I was like oh and I dropped all my shopping I broke jars I cried it was <laughs> just because it was a really it was not a good time like you know I was mm. feeling really like at the time I'd started looking at um going back to school because I was like no one wants to hire me and I don't know how long I can do this retail job for because it's not what I I don't feel like I'm being creative or learning anything um I'm mostly just managing my behavior against rude customers <laughs> and I'm not good at that I was like so I was like oh I need to do something where I feed my brain or use my creativity because this is like so it was kind of soul destroying for me at the time and my confidence was super low but listen I was also really grateful to have a job and be able to pay the bills so that there was that but I was you know in terms of like what my spirit and my soul needed mm -hmm. I was living to go back to school and so when that phone call happened I was like 
uh, like the, the tears of joy of like, I can't believe, like it was so amazing. And it just kind of reignited something in me again. That was like, okay, okay, you can do this. You can do this. Like they auditioned loads of people and they chose you. You can do, you've got something that you can work with, go with it, you know? And I was like, it suddenly just kicked me back into gear in a way um, that, you know, I was, it was so just welcomed because you know how it is when you just start to doubt everything and put yourself down, you know, there's only so much of hearing no before it starts to mess with you a bit, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. That, I mean, those phone calls, that's a beautiful thing because your life can literally, it can change overnight, which is one of the exciting things um yep. about this industry but it's also one of the things where you <laughs> you're like it's like a lottery win sometimes you think oh there must be so many people going for this like i'm not gonna get it but i think sometimes you just don't know yeah and as you say you get something like that and it's like it's the little stepping stones isn't it um that lead to big things but did you i mean working in retail in liverpool did you ever get recognized from hollyoaks yeah constantly yeah but what was that that must have been um it must have been hard because people then constantly reminding you oh yeah you're in Hollyoaks and you're kind of they're like yeah, yeah uh, listen I I mean obviously not everybody and this is not a generalizing statement uh, but it is but we do have a culture just generally in society of like of like loving a fall from grace yeah and not everybody was like that I've actually had some very, very sweet, friendly customers over the, over those um, years I was there, but it was definitely something that I had to interact with, of people enjoying the fact that I was now working in a shop and had to, like, you know, help them or assist them or serve them in some way. And I, def I definitely had comments like, oh, not on, not on telly now, are you? Like, you know, that sort of, oh, oh not... You know, and, but that, what, what is that? What is that? That's like, that's my ego going, you know, like my ego is being a, hurt by that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's not kind, but it's also like, what, what, no, I'm not, but I'm also a responsible adult with bills and responsibilities and I need to pay for my life and I'm not going to sit around and think I'm too good to get a job because I can't afford to do that I don't have you know parents that support my dream and support my creative life you know and if you have that that's amazing like if you have don't have that um pressure then that that's I'm good for you like you won the lottery basically but like um but I didn't have that so I had to look after myself and I I came from a family that was you know you roll your sleeves up and you get to work like you don't no one gives you anything so we're gonna sit there and moan that you don't have money like but you're not working like I was grateful to have a job and like so ultimately I had to have that conversation with myself all the time and I chose that job specifically because I mean I know that zero contract hours are not good but for an actor, when you're like, I need to go to an audition at drop of a hat, I could just give my shift away and then pick up other shifts really, really easily. And um, and like, so I wasn't um, kind of like locked into any specific schedule. Um, but yeah, so, so it wasn't easy, but I also think that kind of thing reminds you that, that this, job is so arbitrary like it can change at any moment one minute something might go in your way the next thing it doesn't and it doesn't for a while and your ego your kind of mindset has to stay on the mission and it has to have the bigger perspective otherwise you know it will eat you up immediately do you know what I mean like it's so 100%. it's so it's it's a tough one but I I was so grateful for that experience. Like I was, I still am when I think about it because, you know, ultimately even now I'm going to do what I need to do to take care of myself, to take care of my family. And if it's not in acting, then I guess it's not in acting, but as long as everyone's got a roof over their head and like got put the lecky on and whatever, 
and mm. moving their tummies um like I'm good I'm set like and that's all I and that was yeah that was the bigger picture for me um just to survive you know and just to have a mm. quality of life that I um you know as, as good a quality of life as I could have at that time so and I'd already had so much kind of opportunity and a, a like privilege and like a, ability to save some money and like you know and so I'd already I was I was just waiting for that next thing I was just trying to figure out my next move and there's like no shame in that and I think people who do shame it like there was a few people who have come out of soaps um in recent years who kind of got shamed for you know working in a retail shop or like you know now now uh doing kind of what quote unquote normal jobs or whatever and it just makes me angry I'm just like if you're not working and you're you sign on then you're just like you know you're you're leech you're you know you're taking from the tax but you know you're like a liability but like if you do go and take your destiny or take your life into your own hands and take control of it you're going to get laughed at and shamed for it. And I was just like, nah, sorry, we're not doing that because it's a real privilege to have a job and to like look after yourself and maintain your life. Like, you know, and that's all I had to just drum and drum into my head. But obviously people will, sometimes people's words will get in and will cut through and make you feel like shit. And you're like, <laughs> But you know what? It. I'm just like I said. I'm grateful for the experience, and um, yeah. The grind is good. The grind is good. I think with any anything like if you if you get to the highest of heights and you don't feel like you've earned it, that's when it's not a good thing. I think to go through those times is important. And um, I mean, we've all been there. We've all had jobs that yeah. have been all right, horrendous. You know, variations of yeah. things. But I think it's important. Like my mom, when I was growing up, she had like multiple jobs to like pass through the things that we enjoyed to do dance, to do acting, to do singing. My mom did multiple jobs. She used to clean some of my teachers' houses or like do things just so we to pay for one singing lesson or one act. You know, she really like dedicated herself to us having opportunity. And she was doing the kind of unskilled jobs that um which obviously is ridiculous but they require skill um but she did all of that for us and so the idea that I would then be like oh no I I'm too good to do a job like that are you crazy I'm here because of jobs like that my passion was gifted to me because of jobs like that so like yeah I yeah I it makes me furious when people get and it, it just shows like a kind of classism or like an elitism of like oh sorry you don't have a wealthy family or a financially stable family that can just fuel and fund your creative dreams like no sorry like I don't have that and I'm gonna work hard and thing is if I was like complaining about my money my mum would literally be like good job then <laughs> <What's wrong with laughs> yeah yeah get a job yeah it's funny isn't it that it's such a strange mentality that I don't know if it's a British thing particularly but there is that strange thing in some newspapers some magazines where they like to sort of punch down at people and you just think god if you're trying and you're working hard towards something your goal or your dream then what is the problem with that yeah no problem and also it doesn't like it it doesn't mean that you failed like the like I said the arbitrary nature of this business the way that you know there are all these factors when you go into an audition there are all these elements and all these factors that they are judging you against or like and or like yeah like judging you against that are completely out of your control it's nothing about your appearance it's nothing about your age or nothing about your performance or nothing that you can physically control there are all these other things before you even walk into the room that are components or elements as to whether or not you might get cast so the idea that like somebody got the job over me 
um, means that I failed at something. So therefore I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a good job. I'm not a good actor. Like that's a really, it's a really dangerous thing to get into because ultimately you are bringing your version of what you think this character is or what you think this character should, should be or you want to present to them. And then someone else will do their thing and someone else will do their thing. And then there'll be all these other things. And they're like, actually, we've got some really great, um, great actors here or some really cool options here. But the director's going for a, a bit more of a, for this kind of tone or this kind of energy. And this person's kind of doing that a bit more. So maybe we, you know, so there's all these other things. So like, the, it, it's really, really hard, easy to fall into the like, oh, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. And you know, when actually we need to like understand that there are so many people that are going to be perfectly good and castable and perfect for this job, but there's going to be just all these other things around why or why or why not someone gets cast. And so like, you can't take it personally. And it's like just having a thick skin and just being like, yeah, I didn't get this one, but maybe there's a next one. Okay, well, in the meantime, I guess I need to go pull some pints for a bit because, you know, that's the game. Like, that is that is the game. <laughs> and so if anyone's shaming you for anything like that, like, it's, I think it's ridiculous. Like, nobody gets into this industry because it's easy and because it's just, like, handed to you, you know? Yeah. Like, so. There's a huge element of luck as well. So, yeah. that makes it even more absurd doesn't it because you just got to be in the right place at the right time um but it is difficult it's difficult not to sometimes take it personally or or you know you overthink things you know everyone does it um of but course, your... like, we are human beings at the end of the day like we are emotional creatures of course and I have done the same thing myself like so many times and um but it's about whether you let those things consume you and become the narrative or whether you you know, I have just certain things I have just like affirmations or things I say to myself that I'm like, okay, just like have that feeling, have that emotion. That's fine. Cool, cool. Get it out. Have a cry, whatever it is. Then just, you know, remember these things. Remember who you are. Remember what your mission is. Remember, you know, and it, it's about breaking that that's mindset, I think, at times. Mm -hmm. Finding some sort of mechanism. I know that that mine is like going out and doing exercise or something that kind of takes your mind off it. That's completely separate. Um, mm. And it, I mean, as you say there, though, are those your kind of like coping mechanisms? Is there anything else that you do in, in the downtime that keeps you kind of sane? <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm quite, uh, can be quite introverted person and I kind of get very, very drained quite easily. So, like when I'm sort of around in a job, I'm like around lots of people and pushing out all this energy. So by the time the job is over or something is over, I'm just so exhausted. Or if I've been putting an energy into something, like I just feel so drained. So like alone time is really important for me in order to sort of like stay to kind of recharge and feel like ready to go. And so if I am in a moment of like uncertainty or like I didn't get that thing I really wanted or I'm feeling down, like be, some people will go, well, being on your own might not be the best idea, but like actually being alone for, to allow myself to kind of process my feelings in a safe environment where I feel comfortable and like at mm. home on my own or with, you know, people that know me so well that, it doesn't matter whether I'm, you know, not quite myself, like, or I can recharge and, you know, remember, like I said, remember the mission or remember, remind myself of the things that I should be really proud of that I've, I've working towards and all of that. Um, but yeah, I think exercise is really important. And I, I sort of say that because recently I've had a huge aversion to exercise. Don't ask me why it's been a bit of a thing. And, and I'm just recently getting kind of back into it because um, I know that it helps me. But sometimes you get so far down the sort of, you know, road where you're kind of negative that it, you it's actually almost like a weird self-sabotage thing. And you're like, I know this is going to help me, but I just can't bring myself to do it. Like it was it's it's been a bit like that recently, to be honest. But like 
um yeah exercise really helps me yoga um just anything that gets my body movement moving gets my body moving and gets me out of my head is a good thing um and to be honest like spending time with people who don't know me as the actress you know or like oh that famous person famous person or whatever it's like I'm just like the baby sister of Louise and I'm the daughter of Debbie and I'm like auntie Nats and you know I'm like Mm -hmm. it doesn't all of that stuff is like irrelevant when I'm with my family like it doesn't matter it's like you're just the, the person that they love and watch grow up and who they cheer on and you all support each other it's it, it's there's no pressure there mm-hmm. be anything but who you are and what you are and if you're not having a great time it's okay if you are good great we celebrate with you but you know there's no pressure to be anything but but but, but what you are and you know I'm very very lucky that I have those people and a lot of people don't have those people and um but I also have my chosen family who I can just be like that around as well mm. And, um, and I, I guess I just like, if you, you know, unfortunately don't have like a support system that is like your immediate family, like th- you can build your own network of people and um, just where you can, if you just need to sit with someone and be quiet, like I have so many friends like that, like, I love that we can do that. <laughs> I'm like, come <laughs> on, and then we just sit there and don't talk to each other, but we're, we're getting in silence. <laughs> that's the best thing you know that you're comfortable with someone when you can just do nothing with them you can just sit there yeah that's that's when you know Mm. um in in terms of i mean obviously you've had you've had so many good jobs over the years but was there one i'm guessing it would be fast and furious but was there a moment where it felt like a game changer like a sort of shift Mm, i think yes um it was I think, well, I think Game of Thrones just was a game changer for me just in my career. Like suddenly I was kind of put on the main stage and especially in the States, suddenly Mm. that industry, which is so much bigger than ours really in the UK, like suddenly everybody was like, oh, Miss Sandy from Game of Thrones. Like, and I would walk into auditions over there and people would just want to t- tell me their theories about the show and it was like <laughs> this immediate like icebreaker before I'd even said a line of the script or the, or the audition scene so it, it was this huge like kind of there was this huge shift that I had never experienced before this like open arm this open armed like response from casting people that I'd never in- experienced before and um, it was really strange. And then people just knowing who you are and not just like your character name, because I don't know if you, I've had, you had this in, before when you were in Oaks, where it was like, oh, they just know your character name. They'd be like, oh, I, mm. oh, oh Sasha in the street. Are you Sasha? Are you Sasha? Yeah. And now people are like, are you Natalie Emmanuel? And you're like, you just, you just uh, full name me. And I, uh, at first it was terrifying because I'd never experienced that. Like, it was just weird. Like it was a whole, I'd be like in the supermarket and be like, and someone would be like, excuse me, are you Natalie Emmanuel? And I'd have this whole thing. I'm like, wait, have I met you before? Who are you? Why do you know my full name? And then I was like, oh, do right. I know you? Or do you just know me from something? That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> but it was so bizarre. But then like, I think what Game of Thrones did is it kind of exposed me to, to all of these other opportunities one of Mm. which was fast and furious and it was yeah that definitely was like a kind of next level thing but I think at the time Game of Thrones was just on this ascension Mm. and I feel like there was a shift between like season three and season four where it kind of kicked into like this phenomenon of a show like like international I mean it was already very internationally um like very highly received and very highly um regarded but it I just felt like there was this sudden shift and they kind of happened simultaneously I think because I was shooting season four and fast seven at the same time I was flying between wow sets um for about I don't know a long time like three months or something where they overlapped and it and and I just remember that 
the year and the year after when that all came out there was this like shift that happened <laughs> in a way that I was in no way prepared for or in any way participated I was like oh I'm just like the little like hacker on the you know I wasn't really you know I was like no one's gonna care about me there's like Vin Diesel there's like Tyrese there's all these like you know Paul Walker there's like these icons and then just little me and then so I didn't think anyone would particularly um care and then it but it yeah apparently once you're in now the past you're, family you're part of the family now yeah <laughs> it's um yeah we, it's game changer apparently I don't know I mean that is that is pretty insane I mean what was that like first day on set the Fast and Furious just walking onto that set with all those big dogs and just being like, okay, this is this is happening then. Yeah, it was surreal. Um, I'm, I also had um, only found out that I got the job like not that long before. Well, what happened was, was that season four of Game of Thrones and Fast 7 were trying to figure out scheduling. And at the, for quite a long time, it was, you can't do both. So there was this period where I was like, no, I'm going to have to like not do fast, basically. And I was like, oh, or not do Game of Thrones, which, you know, it was really, really tense time for a moment because I was like, I want to do both of them. And then it was maybe about four or five days before where they were like, we figured it out. Get on a plane. We need to get you a visa I had to fly to Canada. And then you're going to fly straight to um, Atlanta and do start shooting. And it was so quick. Um but they got there in the end and it was just like amazing, but it was a bit of a whirlwind. So I'd already just had like about three or four days of just complete chaos. Um, and then I got onto set and um, I had a scene, it was like in the first movie, I kind of fly off of a cliff in a car with Vin and we roll down a hill in a car and miraculously we survive. And I have the scene when I wake up after her obvious concussion um, and she kind of calls all of them out and says like, well, you're the alpha, you're the, you've been military trained or police force or something and you're the joker and you're the tech guy and you're the, you know, she knows she's just really on it. She can read them all really fast. So that was my first day of filming Ooh, me wow. versus the entire fast family just little me from south end being like mm. again <laughs> and it was crazy and um, i was really really terrified and um but i you know i also have a practice sometimes of when i'm feeling a bit nervous or a bit um unsure of myself where i visualize um myself to be different or like bigger or to be the thing that I need to be and um you know and there's there's a lot of kind of mental game involved where I was like Natalie you're their colleague like you have worked really hard and you're here and they want you here you're here so like you are their peer you are there and which is a crazy thing to say about people that you've been watching your entire life <laughs> and I had to sort of build myself up in a way that was like oh yeah you're you're like you're going to tell them like you're going to tell them who they are or like your assessment of them and you're going to do it confidently because you know what you're talking about and so there was like a real like thing and so that kind of helped with the nerves and then, and also they were just very sweet and just embraced me completely. And before the end of that day, I was getting teased and ribbed, just like I was one of the gang, you know, like you do with your mate. And I was like, oh, these are nice people. Oh, uh, we're banter. <laughs> I would love a bit of banter. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it, it was a very intimidating morning. <laughs> Um, I was incredibly surprised, but I was also just like, Natalie, this is it. This is what you've been working towards. And this is huge. And like, you know, enjoy it, celebrate mm. it. And just know that you, you, they look, they, again, they cast and they auditioned lots of people. I can't remember the exact amount, but it was like, they received self tapes in the thousands. So like, 
I, you know, and they, what they liked you for it. And that's amazing. Like celebrate it. It's amazing. So I was like, I have to remind myself sometimes because I have a bit of imposter syndrome. I'm sure um, you've like lots of people experience this where they're just like, wait, uh, like, are they going to, they're going to figure out that I shouldn't be here or something. And like, and I have that. So it's something that I battle quite a lot. And um, yeah, so I just, I have to kind of like have real conversations with myself, whether it's in the mirror, whether it's through like, the meditation or visualization or whatever I have to kind of just like trick my brain even if I don't believe that I've got to trick my brain for a minute just to be like you know you're a bad bitch go do this a bitch sometimes <laughs> it's the best way as well to have like a scene like that where it is like you're getting chucked in at the deep end and you've just <laughs> got to do it and you don't have a choice <laughs> and then you're like well I've done that now thing. so easy yeah um yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes that is the best way. And I, I wanted to ask, I mean, we obviously need to wrap this up soon. You're going to have to, you need to go soon. But um, our, we have this thing where um, it's like a bit of a tradition. But is, is there um, is there a moment, like, preferably on, you know, on a film or on a job at some point, was there a moment that you can recollect that was utterly humiliating, like a disastrous moment that you can share with us, that you're happy to share with us? A disastrous moment or a humiliating We've had, just to give you an example, we've had some actors who have said that they've literally been on, on stage naked and farted or <laughs> forgotten their lines. And then it's like they've had to shut down and not film that day. Like we have all kinds of uh, mad things. So if there's anything that that kind of comes to mind. Um, anything that comes to mind. Um, well, not anything as like kind of e extreme as that. <laughs> um but I'm quite clumsy I'm very clumsy and I fall over a lot and I think there are probably a lot of bloopers or like there are a lot of in fact the movie that I just wrapped up on um which is called The Bride I think is um they, they announced it recently it's out end of August I think the 28th or 26th or something um but I Full on face planted, like off the ground. I'm running and I, I'm in this like beautiful dress, this big beautiful dress, and I'm like running and I full on tripped. Like there, I got some air. Like there was some. I face planted into the ground, and it was just very funny because everyone. I heard the whole crew go <gasps> because it was that bad. It was that much it was so such a big fall that everyone was like wait is she okay like oh and then I just burst out laughing because I mean I just I have to, when you're a comedy with me you have to learn to laugh at this because I fall over so 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 much but I had to, actually now I've just said that it's come actually something that just came to mind was I was doing um the sort of uh a sort of short form comedy show Die Heart with Kevin Hart mm. on a that was originally on Quibi and is now on Roku and um there's a scene where we're on these um on strings and we're in this like action star school or whatever and they're like you have to learn how to work green screen and like work on the wires and everything so it's like an exercise for us to like do and I could not stop laughing the second that they picked me up off the ground the sensation of being on the wires I was tears like I couldn't this it made me laugh so much it felt it do you know what it reminded me of it was like you know those bouncers that babies are in when you hang <laughs> yeah. on the door frame that's how I felt and I was like I just feel so ridiculous and then I've got Kevin Hart swinging on wires opposite me being hilarious I could not get it together and we we did have to come back and Oh God. additional photography on that because they there was no way they could shoot my face because I was it was like tears like <laughs> running down my face the entire day and I was like how what did they get around it in the end then did they we have had, to shoot we had to did do you still it shoot it on the wires we did I had to That's just go over it I had to just oh, go no. over it 
but it was ridiculous and it was like I cannot believe I mean I'm you know we talk about corpsing on set like and I'm terrible at that anyway and um but this was like a next level like I was I was so embarrassed I was like I am so sorry but I can't I can't explain why this is so funny and I'm I'm crying I'm crying I can't stop I don't know what to say I'm so sorry and then they're like no don't worry we've got to do extra stuff on that and we'll try and get your coverage um when we do that and that was there's nothing worse than that and though, I got home you... that night and I, I really beat myself up I was like Natalie that is <laughs> professional but I was like I can't help it like this is a new thing like it was just so strange I'd never been on suspended like that before mm. We were being swinging around. Oh God, it was ridiculous. It was really hard as well. I th- I did a film where I had to do like a load of. It was all CGI background, and I was meant to be in a computer game doing backflips and fighting this guy. And it was just like, it's really difficult. <laughs> like we spent days of me trying to get it right, and kind of, and in the end, like the stunt guy did most of it. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to actually control the balance because you're just sort oh. of. Yeah, yeah you all over the place. like your whole sense of your body and like gravity and your where your center is it's all just so foreign and weird and mm. I just realized like I was like I've never done this before and I could it was so very funny to me apparently but it was it made it a fun day like sometimes I was like I know that this is not productive particularly but I look back on that day like quite fondly, even though there were mm. probably like producers and people going, oh my God, can she just get it together? Um, you yeah. can enjoy the journey. But <laughs> it also is what happened. And um, luckily, I mean, Kevin was very supportive and was just like, what? <laughs> like we just couldn't, yeah, I couldn't get it together. And that's, you know, it's, it's what happened. <laughs> And one last thing before you go. Um, I see that you've got a film coming out called, is it Arthur the King? Oh, yeah, when's that, that out? I don't even know when that's out. Um, I'd, yeah. love to, I'd love to say I know, I, I don't know. I just saw it and it was like, it's probably going to be like a year or so from now. It looks like it's quite a way off. But um, Yeah, I mean, you... I actually don't know when that's, when that's out, but we shot that. I was there shooting at this time last year, actually. Oh, wow. In the Dominican. Can you say anything about that or is it all kind of under wraps? Yeah, I'm sort of cautious to say something about that because I don't really know um, what they have said about it. But yeah. um, it's about the sport of adventure racing, um, which is this insane extreme sport where groups of teams of four people, including one woman, do um, a uh, very, very long race over like, 300 and 400 500 miles kind of and it's like can take between five and ten days depending on how fast you are and the sport is incredible like these athletes are insane like they do um uh kayaking running cycling um climbing and um it's over the course of this um this very treacherous terrain and um so that's what the basis of the movie was so I had to kind of do some of those um some of those activities for the first time (laughs) that sounds fun (laughs) any laughing fits on that one or are you all right with that (laughs) no I was I was all right on that that was really intense we we spent a lot of time just in the really hot humid lots of bugs like mm. in the jungle like there was a lot of days like that and to be honest there were, it, you're just like just trying to get through it like you're like I'm so uncomfortable and hot and sweaty or being having rain poured on you for hours mm. that actually there's nothing to laugh about really like we've just got to get through it because the environment was so so tough but it was it was a real amazing it was a real challenge and a one a very welcomed one I was so kind of like this is like nothing I've done before um I got in a kayak (laughs) me kayaking hilarious I did kayaking and I was all right at it I did okay and um the stunt team were amazing and made me look very much cooler than I am 
but also I got to try some of that stuff and um it just goes to show how amazing these athletes are because it's not it's brutal it's brutal sport and so yeah, that's that what kind of moves about and um it's yeah yeah I saw um I actually came across that completely separate to you know chatting to you now I just I just I can't even remember where it was I think it was on IMD yeah it was on IMDb and I just saw oh it's like a new film with Mark Wahlberg and I was like oh cool I was like oh it's Natalie <laughs> I was just like shit I mean I was like oh this is surreal but I'm getting used to it now every time I see your name next to someone like John Travolta or you know all these people that you work with now it's um it's amazing you've done so well um so yeah congratulations and this has been amazing that's thanks for thanks for coming on and having a chat and oh, just nice to have a catch up as well i know i mean it's been so we should do one in person you know yeah definitely um, definitely well uh take care and i'll speak to you soon you too bye. love bye thank you to our guest natalie we're a small independent podcast and we are now part of patreon so if you'd like to get your episodes early amongst other bonuses we would hugely appreciate your support and word of mouth. Thank you. It's a life and fail. 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 And you better come back next month to a life and fail. 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 We hope we carry a positive message to those of you starting out, those of you who are veterans in the industry, and those of you who are simply fascinated by film. For any questions, requests, please email lifeinfilmpodcast at googlemail.com. Thank you.